Masechet Besa Daf Vav. We have four interesting topics. The first one is uh, sadly often relevant, which is burial on Yom Tov, Yom Tov Rishon, Yom Tov Sheni, and Rosh Hashanah. What are all the laws regarding that? Second is interesting law of doing Eruv Tav Shilin on Yom Tov if you forgot to do it the day before. And third, I guess not as relevant, uh, a chicken that hatches on Yom Tov, can, a chick, can you eat that chick? What is that law? And then finally, an egg, uh, we have a statement by Dab that an egg is only fully developed when laid. What does that mean? What is the application of his law? So let's we'll start with uh, bury, the laws of burial. Amar Rava met biyom tov rishon, itaseku bo amamin. If uh, someone dies on the first day of uh, any yom tov, so then a Jew cannot uh, attend the, to the burial. Nevertheless, it's appropriate to bury the person because it's uh, disrespectful uh, to leave the, to leave a, a, a body out. And so instead, we ask a non-Jew to take care of the burial. Asking a non-Jew to do something is uh, shivut, it's a uh, status of a drabanan. And therefore, even though generally we are not allowed to ask a non-Jew to do something for us, but when there's a great need, like um, for a disgrace of a dead body to prevent it, then we are allowed to ask a non-Jew. Met Yom Tov Sheni it asikubo Yisrael. If a person died on the second day of Yom Tov, however, then a Jew, even the Jew, a Jew can deal with the burial, which would involve carrying the body even outside the techum um, and uh, uh, um, uh, digging a hole and so other things that are involved, which would be melachot, are permitted. And so the reason is because. Uh, even though we said yesterday that we keep two days and we're not sure, is it this day or is it that day? And nevertheless, you see, really, we know that the first day is the, is the Deoraita day and the second one is not. And therefore, when it comes to a matter of great need, um, uh, respect for the dead, then we do treat the first day differently from the second day for this halacha um, only. Good. And even for this, the same applies for the first two days of Rosh Hashanah, for the two days of Rosh Hashanah. If it, someone dies on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, potentially, we would ask a non-Jew to take care of it. And if it happens on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, then, um, then uh, the Jews go and they can uh, do whatever they need uh, in order to take care of the dead. <clears throat> Even though that's not true regarding an egg. Regarding an egg, we saw that we consider Rosh Hashanah to be one elongated day. And therefore, you might say, well, since it's one elongated day and we don't, uh, 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 egg that's born on the first day, we still do not eat on the second day. So you might have thought that for burying the dead also, we'll consider it all one elongated day and be the same law. And therefore, on the second day, also, you would not be permitted for, for, uh, for a Jew to go and take care of the dead. And so therefore, Rava comes to teach us that say, and, and say, no, burying the dead is a lot more important than, um, than an egg. And so for the, case, uh, for the sake of burying the dead, even a Jew can do it on the second day of Yom Tov. Uh, okay, I'll just mention the halacha. What we do in here in our community is um, that generally, if someone dies, um, either right before Yom Tov or on the first day of Yom Tov, we generally wait uh, till the second day um, because that way a Jew can go. Uh, and we'd rather some you know, family members want to be able to go to the, to, to the burial. So we'll wait to the second day. And then um, even though technically a Jew could do everything, we still minimize it as much as possible. So we get non-Jewish drivers and uh, they take the body there. And then once uh, they get there, the Jews can be involved uh, on the second day. Um, however, uh, in this past year, um, in the previous Pesach, um, in the beginning of COVID, there were many people, uh, sadly, who died during that time, and the Chevra Kadisha could not handle uh, all the people all on one day. So they could not wait for all, all the people that died on the first day. They could not wait and bury everyone on the second day of Pesach. It would be too many. And therefore, on that, on that occasion, uh, they did follow this first halacha, and they had non-Jews go, went and took the body, and no family members were allowed to go because it was the first day of Yom Tov. And um, that was uh, certainly extra sad uh, that they weren't able to go, but this was done. 
regarding Rosh Hashanah, the widespread community custom is that even on the, on the second day of Rosh Hashanah, we do do burials and the Jews will go in the car to take care of it. There are some who disagree and say not on Rosh Hashanah, but it uh, seems that most of the uh, rabbis in the community do permit it on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. So, um, so these are things that are, are, are in practice in our community. Um, okay, now, now the, the rabbis from the Harda'a, that's a town on the Euphrates in Babel, where there were many rabbis in the yeshiva, they say it's true also for Besa, something that's born on the first day of Rosh Hashanah, you can eat it on the second day of Rosh Hashanah. I know we talked about this already, but we're now relitigating. Re re and they say, why? What's the reason? Because what, what are you afraid of? Why would you not have it? Because you think that Elul was really male and, and Elul was 30 days, and therefore, really, the second day of Rosh Hashanah is the real Rosh Hashanah, right? Is that what you're afraid of? From the time of Ezra until now, Elul was never pregnant. We use that, the word pregnant comparing a month to a woman who's, who's uh, uh, extra fat. So to the month becomes extra fat when it has 30 days instead of, instead of 29 days. So he says Elul never have had 30 days. It was never Meubar. And therefore, really, we don't have to worry. There's no safek regarding Elul. And so therefore, we know for sure the first day of Elul, the first day of Tishrei is the real, uh, is, is the first day of Rosh Hashanah is Aleph Tishrei, is the real day. And the second day, we're just doing as a custom. So therefore, it's born on the first day. It's totally permitted on the second day. That's the opinion of the sages of Nehar De'ah. Um, so that, that's a challenge to, to Ravah here. Amar Mozutra, lo amaran ela da ishtahi, avalo ishtahi mashinan le. Mozutra said, This law that you allow, that Jews are allowed to go to the cemetery and bury on the second day, that only applies if you, um, uh, if you waited. In other words, if the person died on the first day of Yom Tov and now 24 hours went by and, um, and you know, we didn't bury them on the first day and now it's the second day, then we, the, a Jew can go and, and violate uh, Yom Tov to bury the dead. But if we did not wait, if, a Jew, if the person died on Yom Tov Sheni, then we say, wait. Um, and the point is that to leave a body for a short time, just less than a day, is okay. It's still, it's still not gonna decay very much. It's not gonna, you know, be okay. And it's not very disrespectful. So it's okay to wait 24 hours and therefore don't violate Yom Tov Sheni unless the person died yesterday. For the day, this day itself, you can leave them till tomorrow. So that's his opinion. However, Rav Amar, Afagav de Nami La He says, no, even if we did not delay and the person just died, nevertheless, we do not delay the burial, right? And it's greater respect for the dead to uh, bury them um, as soon as possible and not even wait, not even one day. And therefore, violate Yom Tov Sheni for that reason. My Tama, Yom Tov Sheni legabemet kehol shavyu rabanan. Afil le megaz le gedima ul megaz le asa. And what's the reason? What's Rav Asher's reasoning? Because the second day of Yom Tov, when it comes to bear, taking care of the dead, we treat it like a weekday. The rabbis treat it like a weekday. In other words, since the whole thing is Rabbanan, so the rabbis had in mind, Wilson, when you do Yom Tov Sheni, we're doing this as an extra uh, Humrah custom. You know, this is what we used to do. Maybe it'll go back, whatever reason. But when it comes to burying the dead, don't worry about it. And uh, even if it's just a small amount of disrespect for the dead, and you could wait till tomorrow, really, nevertheless, go ahead and do it right away. Because look, even to cut a cloak for the deceased, our, or, to, or to cut myrtles is permitted. Now, these are things that are not absolutely necessary. Um, myrtles, they would take myrtle branches and, and put, it, put them around the coffin to beautify it, to give more respect for the dead. This is not something you need to do, it's just extra credit. And nevertheless, on the second day of Yom Tov, you can violate, Yom Tov, that, violate the day and cut myrtles just, to, just for the extra beauty, extra um, respect for the dead. And therefore, uh, you don't have to wait till till the next day. Okay, so this is very important. I mean, we this we we follow the second one, and uh, we try not to wait at all um, out of respect. 
this was you know even more true back then before refrigerators nowadays you know the person a, a body can be kept um, in in a fine state and won't won't smell and won't decay in a refrigerator and one one can wait um, but uh, and different customs have have different different communities if there are different customs our community here likes to bury right away other communities where people live far away they live in other cities and you want the family to be there that's also out of respect for the dead to wait a day so that they can travel in um, would, would also be appropriate and um, that would fit more better with Ravina. Um, okay, so we have both of these opinions here. Amar Ravina, habare haishinans. Ravina says, nowadays there are habare. Habare is a word from, for the Persian priests, a Zoroastrian magi. Um, magi comes the same like magicians. So Chobed Habed in the Torah is someone who does magic. So they, uh, and the, the rabbis called the Zoroastrian priests um, Habar. So nowadays we have these people around in Babel and they bother us. And you know what they do? When they, if they see us burying someone on Yom Tov Sheni, they say, oh, see, it's not really a holiday for you. Uh, therefore you can go to work. And then they would make us do work on the second day of Yom Tov. So therefore, because they're, they're uh, roaming around and they're always threatening, therefore we should not bury the dead on the second day of, uh, of Yom Tov. Now, what, what's the deal with these Zoroastrian uh, priests? Zoroastrians did not believe in burial in the ground because they, they believe that the ground is holy. So you can't take an impure body and put it in the ground. They also thought that fire is holy, so you can't do cremation. They also thought that water is holy, so you can't throw the body into the, into the, into the water. So what did the Zoroastrians do with their dead? They left them out for the birds to come and eat. And we would say that's horrible, disgraceful. That's like the worst thing we know we read about in the curses in the, in the Tanakh. But for them, that was the best way to do it. So when they saw Jews burying the dead, they would always bother us and, uh, and try to disrupt uh, our customs. And so therefore, this was a way when they saw Jews burying on second day of Yom Tov, they used that to persecute. And therefore, we had to be careful and not give them, give them that opening. And so therefore, um, uh, they, he prevented, uh, he, Ravina said, we should try not to do it. And this might explain, um, yeah, maybe also why, you know, so Mozutrai, he was more lenient and said, you know, try to wait till the next day and don't do it today. All right, fascinating. Ravina Havayatev Kame Derav Ase Okay, that's, that's the, that we finished that um, topic. And now the next topic is Eruv uh, Tavshirim. Um, but it, the, we're continuing on the theme of Rosh Hashanah. Is it really like, Two days of safek or like one long day is going to come up again here. So Ravina was sitting before Rav Ase in the printed edition is fixed to Rav Ashe. Ase and Ashe get mixed up. <clears throat> anyway, on the, on the two days of Rosh Hashanah, Hazir Dehava Asiv, Ravina sees that his master is sad. So what are you sad about? It's the holiday. So it must have been a, a, a year when Rosh Hashanah was on Wednesday night, Thursday, and Friday, and then right into uh, Shabbat, right? Three-day holiday. And so therefore, uh, he should have made Eruv Tavshilin in order to prepare from Rosh Hashanah to Shabbat. You had to make an Eruv Tavshilin on Wednesday. You put some cooked food and say, look, I'm starting to prepare my meal for Shabbat. And that permits one to prepare food on Yom Tov for Shabbat. But he forgot to do it. And now he's going to have a problem because he's not going to have a nice meal for Shabbat. So he feels sad um, about that. So Ravina said, why don't you make a, um, a make an Eruv Tavshilin today, Thursday, the first day of Rosh Hashanah. You can make an Eruv Tavshilin on condition. How? Here's what you could do. I'm making Eruv Tavshilin today on Thursday. And I say as follows. If tomorrow is Rosh Hashanah, because really Rosh Hashanah is only one day. If it's Friday is Rosh Hashanah, then this is my Eruv Tavshilin. Today is a chol, is a secular, is a regular day. I'm making mine today on Thursday for Friday so that on Friday I can cook for Shabbat. And if today is Rosh, really Rosh Hashanah, Thursday, then that means Friday is not, is just a regular day. And then that, that way I don't need an Eruv Tavshilin because I can prepare on Friday for Shabbat. And so therefore, either way, I would be allowed to prepare. So the master, why don't you do that? Rabbi said, you can use this trick. 
Yishnei Mutabir Shalom Shana Mi Amar. Yeah, the Abbas said that regarding other holidays, right? Pesach, Sukkot, Shavuot, when you have two days of holiday, then you can do that. But Rosh Hashanah is not the same. Rosh Hashanah is one long holiday. It's not because of the doubt which day it is. The rabbis instituted that you should take one day and elongate it, so you can't do that. Okay, we learned, we learned an interesting halacha that if someone does forget on the other Yom Tov to do it on Wednesday, you could do this conditional one on Thursday. So this is good. But Rosh Hashanah is one long, one, uh, two days of one long holiday, then why can't you go to the first day to the second day also? Oh, that's another question, right? Cooking from the first day Rosh Hashanah to the second day Rosh Hashanah, right? So technically, if it's really one long day, we then you would be allowed. But we're machmir for both sides, and maybe it's what this day, and maybe it's not that day, right? So we we go back and forth on it, and we treat them uh, both this way. Um, so truth is, you could make this conditional thing on the Thursday. Um, generally, we don't because even if someone forgets to do their uftav shilin, the rabbi of the community um, has everybody in mind, right? He's starting it, and the people can join along. And therefore, we can rely on that. Okay, so now, uh, right, so you can't do it on Rosh Hashanah. Hold on, why can't you do it on Rosh Hashanah? The, the rabbis from the Haradah, we just mentioned them a few minutes ago, say, they say that an egg born on the first day is permitted on the second day. In other words, they treat it like uh, doubt, either the first day or the second day, but not both. And therefore, you could treat it the same as Yom Tov and make a conditional eruv. No, my master explicitly told me, his master Rav Ase or Rav Ashe, whatever the reading is, he said, no, I don't agree with the Nahar De'ayah. I don't think that you can eat the egg on the second day. He treats it like one elongated day. And therefore, he would not eat an egg and he cannot do this conditional eruv tavshilin um, uh, for Rosh Hashanah. Okay, so that ends the second topic. Now we get to the topic of a chick that is hatched on Yom Tov, right? We know that an egg that's laid, you can't eat, but what about a, um, a newborn chick? Um, so Rav says that a chick that uh, breaks out of its egg on Yom Tov is prohibited. Shemuel, or some say to Biochanan, say it's permitted. They, they're all gonna come together. It sounds like we know that Rav says it's, it's not allowed, and his counterpart, sometimes Rav's counterpart is Shemuel, who's also in Babel. Sometimes it's Biochanan, who's in Ed Israel. Okay, whoever it is, his counterpart says it's permitted. Why? Rav says it's, it's prohibited because it's Mukseh. If this was in an egg. The egg was Mukseh, and, uh, and the chick is, continues to be Mukseh. Um, now, and so, right, just like you couldn't eat the egg before, and this is born um, on, on the holiday, even though a chick technically, once a chick is alive, you can do shechita and you can eat it. I mean, there's not much meat on it, but right, you could, you could do that. But it was not, it was not alive when, when the holiday started. And therefore, that's alive now, is still mukseh. So you can't touch it. That's the problem. You can't move it. Mukseh is about moving, not touching. The other opinion that says aloud says that once it's born, so now it becomes available to do shechita. It went from being non, not kosher, a chick inside the egg. Let's say I break open the egg and take the chick out. It's not kosher. It's considered a creepy crawly. Um, and so you can't eat it, even if you do shechita, you can't do anything. However, now that it breaks out of the out of the egg, and now it becomes goes from prohibited to permitted to do shechita. So just like it makes that change in uh, status, so too it now becomes not mukse anymore, right? Because I can use it now; it's usable. So according to this, usually we say that something that's mukse at the start of the holiday is mukse the whole holiday. But according to Shemuel and or the Biochanan here, no. Once it's born. Now I can use it and I can do shechita. So therefore they say it's allowed. So Rav said it's prohibited, but his two students challenge him. So listen to this interesting challenge. So let's compare your case of a, a chick that hatched to the case of a calf that's born on Yom Tov, right? If a mother, a cow, gives birth to a calf on Yom Tov, that calf, you can do shechita and eat it, right? And so 
uh, what's the difference? Just like the calf that's born, it was just born, and I'm allowed to do shechita, so too you should allow the chick that is born, hatches, to, it should also be allowed. That's a good question. So it would answer, it says, no, that's different because when the calf is inside the mother, it's still usable because let's say I did shechita to the mother cow, then I could eat the whole cow, including the fetus that's inside, right? Every part, I can eat the brains, I can eat the heart, you can eat anything. And so I could eat the, ate it. Therefore, it was never mukse uh, the whole time. So now that it's born, it continues to not be mukse. Unlike the chick, when the chick was inside the egg, it was mukse. I would, if I went and opened it, I would not be allowed to use it. And therefore, when it's now, it was since it was mukse, now that it's born, it continues to be mukse. So that's the difference. The chick before it's born is not usable, is mukse. The calf, even before it's born, is usable, is edible, right? If I kill the mother, I can eat the I can eat the calf inside. All right, so that's a good point. Now, challenge again, Tadav. Let's say the mother cow is terefa, it's sick, it's not going to last a year. So therefore the mother cow is not kosher. If I would do shechita on the mother cow, I wouldn't be able to eat it or the fetus, right? In fact, the whole thing is mukseh. I can't even touch this cow. Uh, I can't even move it. And yet, if it gives birth, then the child of a terefa, assuming the child is healthy, is kosher. And therefore, even if it would give birth on Yom Tov, I would be able to do shechita on the baby calf and eat it. And so this is as comparable to the case of a chick in both of them, just like the chick before it's born is mukseh, not usable. Um, so too the calf before it's born is not usable mukseh because the mother is mukseh. And yet when the calf is born, it's allowed. So too the chick when it hatches should be allowed. This is a real problem. For Rav, it's such a big problem. Rav has no answer. Shatek Rav. He's quiet. Okay. So, so, yeah, he's stumped. Nevertheless, later on, we're going to try to bring an answer for him. So later students said, why was Rav quiet? We have a good answer. That mother cow, that's Terefa, can be used to feed to dogs. Um, doesn't necessarily mean you can do shechita for the dogs. There is an opinion like that. You can even do shechita on Yom Tov to feed your dogs, but that's not, that's a minority opinion. Um, probably this means that you would give the live cow to the dogs. The dogs would hunt it and, you know, kill it and eat it, but that's permitted. Since I have in mind on the beginning of Yom Tov, you know what? What am I going to feed the dogs tomorrow? Oh, I'll take that tedefa cow and that'll be. So then it's not mukse because I have in mind, I'm going to use it to feed the dogs. And therefore, the baby, the calf that's inside, is not mukse because I can use it to feed the dogs. Therefore, if it does give birth, and I say, oh, look, it gave birth. You know what? I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat the calf. It's permitted because the mother was not mukse, so the baby is not mukse, and the whole thing is allowed. And that's unlike a chick, where a chick, a chick, a chick is not dog food. Uh, no, 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 nobody would eat it. There's nothing on it. So uh, therefore, the chick inside the egg as mukseh, I have in mind nothing to not use it at all. And therefore, even if it hatches on, on the holiday, it was mukseh before, and it's no good now. So that's a good answer, right? The, the, the cow is actually not mukseh because it's food for the dogs. Amar le'abaye, hashta mukhan le'adam, lo have mukhan lichlabim. So Abaye's response to this is, uh, is which would be a re-challenge to Rav, is going to be that um, just because something is, is uh, edible for a dog, and I have in mind, it's still nevertheless not edible for a human, and therefore mukse for human food. There's different categories of mukse. And uh, so um, I can have in mind, I'm going to use it for dog food, but I still can't use it as human food. It's still mukse in terms of that. And that's what he's going to prove now. So he's going to prove from a kavachomet even, right? Something that is, is food for a human cannot be used as food for a dog on Yom Tov, because I only had in mind that a human, human, a human is going to eat it. And where do we see that? In the Mishnah. One is allowed to cut a gourd, pumpkin or gourd for an animal, and you can cut it up. Also, an animal that died on its own, I'm allowed to take it and cut it for the dogs. 
So this, according to this, it is allowed. says, only if it died before Shabbat, then I had in mind, this will be dog food, so then I can handle it. But if it died on Shabbat, it's mukseh. And it's not allowed, asura, the fi she'ena min hamukhan, because it's not prepared. So you see here that something is mukhan, um, um, uh, according to the Biudah's opinion, even if it's prepared for a human, if I didn't have in mind for a dog, I can't feed it, I can't even feed it to the dog. So if that's true, then mukhan the klabim, avim mukhan the adam, something that was only going to be food for a dog. So then for sure, it cannot now be considered ready, prepared to be human food. And therefore, the mother terefa, that was, I had in mind, all oh, feed it to the dogs. Um, fine, you're allowed to give it to the dogs. But if the calf, if it gives birth to a calf, and now I say, oh, now I want to eat it as human food. No, it's mukseh. It's only permitted as dog food. It's not permitted. Um, it's not, you didn't designate it as human food and therefore it's still mukseh. And so we can, um, and this is uh, uh, therefore what Rav meant that it's actually the same. Both of them would be prohibited, both this case of the, of the terefa and the chick. Okay. Amar le in mukhan adam lo have mukhan le klabim. Demai hazila le inish la shade le le klabim. Mukhan le klabim have mukhan le adam de daate de inish a kol mide de hazile. So we have one last rejection of, uh, of this uh, um, uh, logic, which is that, um, in fact, it works one way, but not the other. Something, something that is meant uh, to be human food, um, I don't, I'm not going to feed it to the dogs. This is good food. You know? I'm not going to give it to the dogs. So therefore, I can use it for human food, but it'd be mukseh to use as dog food. On the other hand, the other way around is not true. If something I had in mind, you know what? This is substandard, it's going to be dog food. But if something changes and now it becomes available a good for as human food, a person's always going to have in mind that he's going to eat whatever he can. And so therefore, this animal that was uh, this mother uh, cow, that was terefa. Okay, what can I do? I have to feed it to the dogs. But if it gives birth to a, to a calf and that calf is perfectly kosher, then implicitly I have in mind that, yeah, I would eat it if I could. And so that, that raises the level. And so that, is, uh, that would be permitted. Okay, so then in that case, this would be a challenge to Rav. All right, so now that we went through that interesting comparison between a chick that's hatched and a calf that's born, we're going to go back to the original machlok between Rav and his opponent. And we say, Tanya kivate de Rav, Tanya kivate de Shmuel, vitemar de We have a, a baraita that supports Rav, who is stringent, and we have another baraita that supports Shmuel or de Biochanan, whoever says that it is permitted. So here's the first one. Tanya kivate de Rav, Aigel shenolad biyom tov mutar. Um, a calf that is born on Yom Tov is permitted because, right, it's totally fine. The calf was edible, and if they, I killed the calf and uh, found the fetus inside, that would be permitted. So too, when it gives, when it gives birth, it's still permitted. So there's no problem on Mukseh. However, the um, uh, chick that's born on Yom Tov, it was inedible when it was in the egg, and therefore was mukseh, and even if it's born on the min, uh, during the day, it's still mukseh. So you see, this is exactly what I've said. What's the difference between the two cases? That uh, regarding the cow, it was considered prepared, I mean, I had in mind to use it by, um, by doing shechita on the mother, therefore even if it's born, it's still okay. And regarding the chick, it's not prepared on account of its mother, um, right? The mother had nothing to do with it. It was uh, laid whenever it was laid. And, that, and it's prohibited at this point. Good. So here's a braita that supports the other side, that both of them are allowed. Um, the calf that is born on Yom Tov, I can do shechita and eat it. And the chick that's hatched on Yom Tov, also, I'm allowed to do shechita and eat it. My tama Although they're for slightly different reasons, the calf is already prepared because I could have eaten the mother with the with the fetus inside, so too I can eat it. And uh, and the um, and the chick, even though it was prohibited when it was inside, now that it's born, and um, as now I can, I possible to do shechita. So it's matir it un, that undoes the status of mukseh, and now I can handle it and do shechita and eat it. And that is exactly what Shemuel and Rabbi Yochanan say.
Okay. Now, one last opinion in this, uh, on this topic. So here's a Braita that would also support Rav that said it's prohibited. But we have another opinion in this Braita. Rabbi Eliezer ben Yaakov Omer, a chick that, is, that hatches itself is not permitted even on a, re- on a weekday. Because it didn't open its eyes. In other words, even after it comes out of the shell, you, need, you have to wait a certain amount of time uh, because it's still considered a creepy crawly until it opens its eyes. And Shulchan uh, Aruch adds that you have to wait till it grows feathers. It has to be considered a bird. Uh, and then you could do shechita when it's a bird. When, it, when it's first born, you look at it, you say, what is that? That doesn't look like a bird. Um, so you have to at least wait till it opens its eyes. Good. We have a Braita that says, you're not allowed to eat anything that creepy, the all creepy crawlies on the earth are, are not kosher. And so why does it say lechol, anything? What else is it adding besides the things that are on the, on the list? This, is, this adds a, um, we add a chick that hasn't opened its eyes yet. Who would be the author of this paraita? Keman, Kedibili, Aizer, Ben Yaakov. That would be this, his opinion. Good. And now the last topic on the list um, is um, an egg that uh, we have a statement that an egg is only fully developed when it's laid. Let's see what this statement is. And then we'll analyze it. That's a statement. It's a bit of a cryptic statement. It says that an egg, as it's laid, that is when it is completed, right? Uh, an egg is not is incomplete until the until the chicken lays uh, lays the egg. Okay. Now, what, why is that telling us this? What does it mean? My For what practical halacha would this affect? Maybe he means to say that only after it's laid, then it's considered an egg and, and, a, and I can eat it, with, eat it with milk. In other words, it, when it's still inside the mother, let's say I would kill a chicken. Chicken is considered meat. I can't eat it with milk. What about an egg that I find inside the chicken? Oh, that would be prohibited because it's part of the chicken. Only when it's laid, then it becomes a full egg separate from its mother, and then I'm allowed to eat it with milk because it's not meat anymore. Okay, it's an interesting thing that even though an egg comes from uh, uh, a chicken, still you can eat it with milk. <clears throat> Maybe that's what he means. Um, and we would infer from that that while it's still inside the mother, it's considered meat and I can't eat it with milk. Um, but this is not true. Uh, uh, we have a Braita against that and says, And I find uh, whole eggs inside. I am allowed to eat them with milk. That is the halacha. So Rav could not possibly go against the Braita. So that can't be what he meant. <clears throat> so let's try again. Uh, second interpretation. We're going to reject this one too. We're going to go to, to a third interpretation. The second one is Ella. What it means is that um, if it's born, um, that's when it's completed, and that's when I can eat it on Yom Tov the next day. In other words, only if it's born on one on day one, then I can eat it, eat it on Yom Tov the next day. It's only completed when it's born. But but if it's still inside the mother, then, and I find it on Yom Tov, then it would be prohibited. Um, that would be the idea because it's not, it's not, it wasn't ready yet, even though it was there yesterday. Um, so would that be the implication? That doesn't make sense either. Because that also goes against the explicit right that says, if I take a chicken, I do shechita on chicken, I find whole eggs in it, they're done, they're completed, they just haven't, uh, haven't had a chance to, to lay it, it's permitted to eat on Yom Tov because it wasn't born, so it's not nolad, it's just part of the mother, and I can eat any part of the chicken, including the egg. So that can't be the implication of Rav's statement that only when it's laid is it completed. That's not true. Um, <clears throat> it's, uh, if I find it inside, I could also eat it. And maybe you'll tell me, you know what? We should reject this Braita, right? Maybe this Braita isn't true. Uh, it says it's allowed. Maybe it's not allowed because after all, it's not found in the Mishnah. And the Mishnah doesn't teach us that this is permitted. And so the Biudah and Asi left it out of the Mishnah. 
So maybe he didn't agree with it. This is an interesting methodology. It brings up a whole hornet's nest, right? Because we quote what I thought all the time. Um, and that seems to be what the statement means. But we reject that anyway. Because the truth is, if you look carefully, this law that you're allowed to eat a chicken, uh, an egg inside a chicken that you do shechita, um, is actually is actually implied in a Mishnah. How so? The first Mishnah of our Masechet says uh, egg born on Yom Tov. Bet Shammai says you can eat it. Bet Hillel says you cannot eat it. But you see, the whole controversy is only when it was uh, laid. But they don't even talk about while it's still in a chicken. So we can assume that everybody would agree that it's permitted, even Bet Hillel. And so um, you see that we, uh, this, our, our Mishnah supports the Braita. And since it supports the Braita, it's a real challenge to that. And maybe you'll say, no, the Mishnah doesn't mean that. And maybe really Betilel say an egg that's born, that's laid is not allowed. And it's even not allowed if you find it in the chicken when you slaughter it on Yom Tov. And even though the Mishnah only mentioned the case of when it's actually laid, they mentioned that case because they wanted to show you the strength of Bet Shammai that they say, even if it's laid, it's permitted. That's why I emphasized that case. And uh, so that but if so, that baraita that we just quoted up, up here that says it's allowed, who would be the author? It couldn't be anybody. Um, so therefore, uh, we, we cannot just reject this, um, this Braita, and we have to read the Mishnah supporting the Braita, and therefore, um, the truth is that everyone agrees that if you find an egg inside the mother, it's permitted to eat on Yom Tov, and so that cannot be the implication of Rav. So finally, here's the final answer. Ella, im nigmera, umigadelet efrochim. Bemeima, enam megadelet efrochim. An egg that's laid can develop into a chick. An egg that's not laid cannot possibly develop into a chick. And it seems that this is scientifically true because it's in the last stages, just the last day before an egg is, is laid is when it develops the, the shell. And the shell isn't just there for protection. If an egg is laid without a shell, the, all the moisture ev evaporates and the, the, uh, the chick cannot possibly develop. Um, and so uh, Rav is telling us some scientifically interesting thing that, you know, if you want an egg that has a chicken side, then you have to make sure it's laid. It's never not fully complete until it's laid. Don't think that, oh, the last few hours are inconsequential. You need those hours uh, in order for it to be complete. Okay, now this is a very interesting scientific truth, but Rav is not a scientist. He's not telling us the interest, intricacies of biology. He's not the nature channel. He's a uh, halachic posek. So what's the halachic uh, implication of what he said? So lemay nafka mina. It has a difference for buying and selling. For example, was, there was a person who said, um, I, I want to buy eggs from a live chicken. I don't want, um, I don't want a, a one from a dead chicken that you killed and found the eggs inside. I want eggs that are laid. I want to buy some. Anyone have? So one guy comes and says, yeah, I have, and he sells it to them. But he tricked them. And he really gave him eggs that he found inside a dead chicken that he did shechita on. And well, the guy doesn't know the difference. He looks the same. So he takes him home. But then he finds out, oh, was, these, are not, these are not the eggs I was looking for. They're not good. And so he brings a lawsuit. And he comes to Rav Ameh. Right? Rabbi Ameh said, this is a mistaken transaction. And you have to give him the money back. This guy asked for uh, eggs from that were laid from a live chicken, and you gave him eggs that you found in a dead chicken, and it's not the same, and therefore you have to give back the money. So you see that Rav's uh, statement has real implications. Um, so even though it's only you know a few minute difference between before it's before it's born and after it's laid, nevertheless that is an essential difference and it's a fundamentally different thing to the extent that you could say this is not what I asked for. It's a different type of merchandise altogether. Um, last point, Peshita. Isn't this obvious um, that this would be a Mekah Ta'ut, right? You asked for one thing, I asked for apples, you gave me oranges. It's a different item, right? I might have thought 
that really it's the same basic item and he was going to eat it either way. Why was he asking for, for eggs from a, from a live chicken? Because they're a little bit better for eating than the ones from a dead chicken. Uh, the, the shell is a little harder. They, they cook better. They taste better. They're a little bigger. So he wanted them to eat anyway. So the seller said, ah, these are fine. He doesn't, this guy doesn't know the difference. And so he would sell it to him. So the man If in fact he was meant, he, was, he had in mind to eat them either way, then when he brings them to court, he could have said, listen, you sold them inferior quality. You have to pay him the difference, right? He wanted things that are worth a dollar and you sold them, sold them something that's worth less. So you have to pay him back that 10% difference. That's what would have been the law. Kamash Malan. Therefore, Rav teaches us that, no, they're fundamentally different. When someone asks for um, eggs from a live chicken, it's probably because he wants them to grow into a chick. And they can only grow into a chick if they are born and not if you find them inside. And therefore, it's fundamentally different. And then therefore, you have to give back the money and the whole transaction is canceled. Baruch Adonai Lolam. Amen. Amen.